SPJIMR Center for Wisdom and Leadership presents its podcast series called Past Imperfect. You're listening to Past Imperfect, a history podcast brought to you by the Center for Wisdom and Leadership at SPJIMR. I'm Dinyar Patel. If there were a Nobel Prize in history, Linda Colley would be my nominee. That's how the Harvard historian Jim Lepore has described our guest today. Linda Colley is a professor of history at Princeton University and the author, most recently, of The Gun, the Ship, and the Pen, a remarkable global story about the development of constitutions. This is, quite simply, one of the best books which I've read in recent years. Thank you for joining me today, Linda. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. In, in your book, you've, you've written about how written constitutions spread across the world from the late 18th century until the early 20th century before World War I, and, and how this was linked to costly new forms of warfare and why this is important for understanding constitutions. I'd like to begin by asking something a little bit more present, uh, something grounded in the 21st century and our, our current authoritarian moment. In that light, what is relevant about constitutions today? What what is the relevance of constitutions today, I should say, rather? Uh, We increasingly see how authoritarian leaders, everyone from Vladimir Putin to Donald Trump, have been able to completely disregard constitutional provisions and and get away with it. And, you know, I'm speaking to you from a country, India, where all you have to do is turn on the news every every day to see the constitution being violated. Do you have any thoughts on what the current, you know, the, the, the current divergence that we see between what's on paper and what is happening in practice uh, is linked to larger and longer contestations of the history of constitutions? Well, first of all, I think we need to query the rather rosy notion that constitutions have always and are always to do with ensuring rights and restraining power. That is one ideal. But of course, constitutions historically have frequently been used by um, quite authoritarian polities, uh, and they still are. Uh, Think of China, where the preamble to the current constitution, which was brought in in its initial form in the 1950s, um, says explicitly that Taiwan is part of the Chinese motherland. Now, that's a very useful thing for uh, the Chinese authorities to have in the preamble of their constitution, because it legitimizes, of course, what seems likely to be uh, a future Chinese move against Taiwan. So we must realize that constitutions, in fact, can enable authoritarianism. But of course, the the other trend of constitutions can be to curb authority. Uh, But these are the creations of human beings who as we know, are fallible and devious creatures. What I think, looking at constitutions for the book, uh, taught me was the importance of regular amendments to the constitution. Uh, This is arguably one of the problems that the USA has at the moment. Its constitution is very old, very venerated, but it's really out of date. And some of its provisions as for the Supreme Court are basically outdated. They've passed their sell by date. The other thing that is vital, not just keeping the constitution well amended, but also keeping an eye on it um, and paying attention to it and calling it out if the government outrages it. And I think one of the problems we've got to think about with these extraordinary instruments, codified constitutions, is how do they keep going in a more digital world, a much more digital world, where people get their information from a screen, not from the printed or written page, and where increasingly people are going into 
uh, digital to form their political opinions and prejudices. How do we maintain constitutions insofar as they are as useful and democratic instruments? Yeah, we, and in India, we're at a quite unique moment where you know the constitution, which, as you know, is one of the, you know the longest, if not you know one of the longest, if not the longest constitutions in the world, is 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 gaining some popular um, symbolic value. I mean, when we had uh, protests about two years ago against provisions limiting citizenship for immigrant uh, for you know refugees who are Muslim. Uh, over here, the constitution became a rallying symbol. So it's, it seems in, in some regards, even in this digital era, I mean, even amongst youth, uh, there is some uh, grasping of the symbolic importance of constitution. That, that, that seems to remain, at least that symbolic importance. And, and certainly, as you mentioned, in the United States, the symbolic importance of the constitution might, in fact, you know, outweigh the, the practical value you get from keeping this really, really old document. Yes. And, you know, venerating something is not enough. You've got to know what it says uh, and you've got to make the words count. But I think India has, partly because its constitution is relatively, relatively recent, 1950. Um, and that constitution was devised, I think, uh, certainly by people like Ambedkar, to be a, a teaching tool to, uh, and, and we know from recent work done on the Indian constitution, how ordinary Indians have since 1950 reached into the constitution and found passages in it that are useful to them. And that's very important and that must continue. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think I think you're talking about Rohit Day's work over here, which is, you know, really helped kind of popularize this idea of how the Constitution is, is not this remote document, but really something that is, is living in so much of, um, of Indian society uh, today. Um, yeah. Now, uh, you know, when you, you've, you've talked about how, um, you know, constitutions were very much, you know, products that were kind of um, elements of their time, right, in, in your book, uh, in the sense that, you know, they were linked with things like technological in innovations, uh, like the spread of or, uh, the spread of print, the advance in, in shipping communication, um, things like uh, the dissemination of, of printed books and translations in different languages. And, and I want to go back to what you mentioned a little bit earlier. You, earlier, you make this, this rather provocative comment uh, that the political discussion in, uh, in the United States is dysfunctional precisely because the Constitution is, is too old. Um, from the research that you did on constitutions, uh, did you get, you know, certain important arguments in favor of the need for radical and constant constitutional change? I know you talked a little bit about amendments earlier. You mean in America itself? Or globally, globally. Um, one of the fundamental reasons why I wrote the book, well, there were many reasons, but one reason why I wrote the book as I did was to get people thinking harder about these devices, to get them, to encourage people to think of them as a transnational and transcontinental phenomenon, um, and to encourage people not to take them for granted, but to think about what they can do and as I suggest, how to keep them lively. Um, in the United States itself, there is, as you know, uh, an extraordinary cult of the Constitution, partly because uh, many Americans think that the Constitution drafted at Philadelphia in 1787 was the first codified Constitution. Well, it wasn't. Uh, as I also try and show in the book, but it, it was a very important and influential constitution, but it's an old one. It's the oldest constitution still keeping going now. Uh, very hard to amend, as I say. And so, you know, these things need thought and, and they need action too, to, to keep them pertinent. Yes, I, I, I remember, you know, at least going through college uh, in the United States, we had a, a historian deliver a lecture to uh, 
um, our class where he was talking about how the, the gathering of individuals in Philadelphia represented the, you know, the, the greatest minds that had ever gathered in, in human history. And I remember several of my, of my classmates next to me who were Singaporean or Chinese kind of rolling their eyes <laughs> a little <laughs> bit, you know, kind of, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of the, the, the cult that, 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 that has been built up in the United States and you know, we're, we're seeing it play out a bit more has, has done a lot of damage as well as good as well. I want yes. to ask you next about the, the genesis of this project. Uh, why constitutions in particular? Um, I, I know in, in some of your previous work, you've uh, pointed to the role of warfare, particularly warfare involving the French uh, in, in terms of you know, things like forging British national identity. Uh, to what degree was your book influenced by uh, this you know, previous work that you had undertaken, as well as the, the current constitutional crisis that we're seeing around the world? I think I was influenced by two things. I've always enjoyed tracing the influence across frontiers of texts of different kinds. In my book, Captives, I looked at captivity narratives written in three continents by captured Brits, if you like, uh, and I enjoyed working out what these texts meant, um, their bias, how they influenced people. And so in a sense, though on a much larger scale, looking at political constitutions built on this interest in texts, but more profoundly, as my accent suggests, I, I was born in the UK, but since the early 1980s, I've spent most of my academic career in the United States, where, as we've said, there is a cult of constitutions. And so I came to the United States as an outsider. I came to written constitutions because the UK doesn't have one as an outsider. And so I, I became increasingly curious about these instruments. And I thought that perhaps being an outsider might help me to approach them in a rather different and more wide-angled way. So, you know, I mean, the, the typical idea that we have of people uh, forging constitutions, as you said, of, you know, those, those, those group of men in, in, in Philadelphia or say the, you know, the, the French Revolution in, in, in the, the 1790s, but your book introduces us to a very different cast of characters, right? I mean, people like Catherine the Great, uh, who authored the Nakaz in the 1760s in Russia, uh, someone like Pomari II, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, in, in Tahiti, who introduced a legal code uh, in 1819, uh, um, or even, and this is my favorite example from your book, uh, Joseph Stalin, who, who cast a constitution for the Soviet Union in 1936. Uh, you've described constitutions as, as bargains on paper uh, with particular military objectives in mind. Uh, how does all of this force us to see constitutions in a, in a different light? Well, I wanted to show how, both how constitutions in different parts of the globe often influenced each other, but also show how in different localities, uh, they were usually shaped in distinctive ways. So in almost all cases of constitution making, you see both borrowing, plagiarism, if you like, and uh, a desire to cater to local needs and cultures and to domesticate uh, this instrument uh, by making it seem um, unique. So, I mean, again, the Indian constitution, someone has worked out, I think, that about 60% of the text of the original Indian constitution looks back to various texts devised in London in the 1930s. But, of course, it had to be made into something uh, genuinely Indian, and so its makers devote a lot of effort to, to working out how to do this. I mean, one of the things that Ambedkar does is he, he wants to try and include illustrations 
in the master text of the Indian constitution uh, with images of Indian gods and goddesses, uh, scenes from folklore and so forth, so as to make this uh, an authentically Indian document. And, and I find that mix of borrowing across boundaries and how different polities tried then to domesticate this document a very I found it a very intriguing one to chart but I did want to incorporate as you say different characters uh people from different occupations a lot of my actors are soldiers because so many of these constitutions are taking off from a war uh, or uh, some kind of military or violent shock. In many ways, we can see the Indian constitution following in those footsteps. I mean, you know, the country had experienced virtual civil war just a few years beforehand with, uh, with the partition. Uh, so in, in the, the, there's, there's some interesting commonalities and divergences between the Indian story and, and many of the other stories you've shown. And um, it's interesting you mentioned the art also in the Indian constitution. I, I agree. I mean, the, the document is uh, one of the most beautiful, at least of constitutions that have been uh, devised around the world with having you know, this, this art directed by uh, Nandalal Bose, who interestingly enough was an artist who was uh, influenced a lot by Japan, and Japan is something I'll talk. About, I'll want to ask you about a little bit later in, uh, in this recording. Um, so, when we think of constitutions, ultimately, you know, we're, we're talking to a very large degree about the history of political liberalism, and I, I, I you know, I think you've you've you introduced a really important element uh, into the discussion by talking about the the the, the omnipresent role of, of war, uh, but. Liberalism is popularly understood as something developed by white, white old men in Europe and, and America in the 18th century, and only then later filtrating to other parts of the world, uh, usually through colonialism. Uh, but oftentimes in your book, you show a very different story, um, a, a ready and almost simultaneous attempt uh, to adopt um, uh, elements of liberal thought through these constitutions uh, and regularly in defiance of imperialism. Uh, you know, there's the example of the Haitian Revolution, which you cover, and then uh, other places like Liberia, Tahiti, and, and Hawaii, uh, which I find particularly interesting. Uh, does the history of constitutions that you have put together, does it tell us a, a different narrative of how liber liberalism developed around the world? Well, I think it can contribute to that. Of course, uh, number one question, how, how do we define liberalism? But if we think as a component part of it of better individual rights, um, the uh, franchise, um, initially the franchise for men, um, then certainly uh, what I'm talking about in different parts of the world feeds into that. And what I tried to show in some areas was that I, I, I borrowed a phrase from Jürgen Osterhammel, uh, defensive forms of modernization. And how does that feed into constitutions? Well, as constitutions take off, they begin to be associated with ideas of political modernity. So what you tend to find very often in different parts of the globe in the 19th century and indeed after is territories which see themselves as being under threat from Western colonization or Western invasion of some kind saying, hey, let's, let's create our own codified constitution as a way of asserting our autonomy, as a way of exhibiting uh, our reformed administration and government as to demonstrate that we have the rule of law and so forth. And then let's print out this document and send it to different parts of the world and say, look, we don't need to be colonized. Never mind want to be colonized. We are a modern polity. Look, here's our constitution to prove it. And you see Hawaii 
uh, doing that again and again and again after 1840, producing a series of very interesting constitutions, which genuflect to local conditions, but also set up um, uh, much more widespread voting, uh, much more clarity about the limits on the Hawaiian monarch, and so on and so forth. And they distribute these constitutions very widely. Now, in the end, of course, they can't stop the United States taking over Hawaii, which happens in the 1890s. But you can see the constitution being used that way. And Tunisia tries to do the same thing after 1861, it, again, in part to keep Western colonialism at bay. That doesn't work either. But when Japan adopts something like a similar strategy in the 1880s with the great Japanese constitution of 1889, this does work. Uh, and Japan is able to use this constitution as a way of reinventing itself, as a way of positioning itself as a modern polity to be taken seriously and left alone. Yeah, in, in many ways, I, I, I like how you've characterized constitutions as, as kind of like a signpost to, to colonial powers from Europe. Look elsewhere, please do not invade here. Uh, and of course, it, it doesn't always work, as you say, right? I mean, you yeah, know, even, yeah, even, even in the United States, right? You had the Cherokees, I believe, who, who had written a constitution. And of course, we all know what happened to them uh, by, the, by the 1820s or 1830s. So get into Japan. And you know, I, I think you know, the, what you've laid out over here about the international influences on the Japanese constitution and then the dissemination of the ideas of the Japanese con constitution to other parts of the world, particularly in, in Asia, uh, is extremely important. I mean, you, as, as someone who you know, has done a lot of research on early 20th century India, it's incredible the degree to which Japan is everywhere uh, in, in conversations, right, about education, about politics, about economics. Uh, what factors in particular explained the, the popularity of the Meiji constitution across Asia, not just India, uh, but in other places, as you mentioned, China, um, other parts of, uh, you know, uh, of Asia that were either experiencing colonialism or were reacting against the threat of colonialism? Success, I suppose. Um, <laughs> the, the, the most influential constitutions tend to be, not invariably, but tend to be those that last and that are perceived as successful. And whereas there had been earlier Asian constitutions, the Ottoman Empire uh, created one briefly in 1876, but it is a brief survival. But the, the Japanese constitution of 1889 endures until the Second World War, uh, when obviously Japan's defeat means it gets given uh, or has to create another constitution. It's not a particularly ambitious constitution in much of its drafting. Uh, the, the Japanese emperor retains uh, a lot of power. Um, the electorate and in the initial version is very small, but it does, it does exist. It sets up curbs on authority in various ways. It creates a kind of parliament. Uh, and as I say, it endures, and it endures in the midst of a fast change in Japan, which is becoming industrially very successful, and which is also winning wars. It defeats China in a war in the 1890s, and even more influentially, it defeats Russia in 1905, 1906. And, and it's this, I think, which more than anything else really excites people because they can say, look, here is an Asian power, a constitutional Asian power defeating uh, a so-called white power, 
which is authoritarian, namely Tsarist Russia. Here, here is Asia being modern and winning out uh, against the non-modern white men, if you like, putting it crudely. Uh, and, and many of the publicists at the time, not just in India, not just in China, among those in that empire wanting reform, uh, also in some of the Arab regions of the world, uh, the Ottoman Empire, the, the Japanese constitution really takes off and, and people study it as part of this seemingly extraordinary success story that Japan appears to be generating. Yeah, I think that's that's a really important link that you make over there, that success of a particular polity is, is linked in many ways to the popularity of the constitution or at least the structure of government of a particular country. And in that sense, Ottoman Turkey is, is a fantastic comparison, right? I mean, you have the, the sick man of Europe not being able to uh, maintain a written constitution and force, and yet you have this, this rising power in, in, in the East, Japan, uh, which, you know, as you mentioned, had a constitution in force that, albeit very limited in terms of its, its liberal appeal and such, uh, remained in force all the way through World War II. Linda, we're, because of um, new limitations on Zoom, we're going to have to generate a new Zoom. So speaking about Japan, in your book, you describe the Japanese constitution as being quite a conservative document, right? In the sense that, you know, obviously it's, it's borrowing from, from the constitutions of places like Prussia, and so there's, you know, an imperial figure built into the constitution, suffrage is limited. Uh, so it's, it's conservative in many ways. And you describe how that conservatism is, is quite appealing uh, across large parts of Asia. But at the same time, there, there's some elements of both the Japanese constitution and other non-Western constitutions like Tunisia's, which you mentioned from 1861, which are quite strikingly liberal in, in the sense that I think both Correct me if I'm wrong, both the Japanese constitution of 1889 and the Tunisian constitution in 1861 talked about freedom of religion at a time when that wasn't entirely the case in, in many parts of Europe, right, with, with persecution against uh, Jews still being quite common and uh, limitations on the rights of particular religious minorities. So in, in what ways could these documents be both very conservative and very liberal at the same time outside of uh, the, the Euro-American world? I think... As I say, what, what is striking to many is that these exist uh, as far, you know, their very existence is important. Um, and, for example, the Tunisian constitution uh, says that uh, every Tunisian male has a right uh, if he has the ability to uh, take an office in the state. Um, it, it very explicitly also the Tunisian constitution um, provides uh, rights for Tunisia's Jewish population, though uh, I, I think there was a certain amount of um, both French and English encouragement uh, involved in that. So you you can... I, I think, too, when we're talking about liberalism in terms of rights being granted by these extraordinary documents to the population, we've also got to accept that governments of all hues in different parts of the world can begin to think of this as an advantage to provide rights, because one of the things that they're thinking about, increasingly governments have to do that, is as war becomes more uh, involving more and more fighting men, and it is usually men in the 19th and early 20th century, then how do you get uh, people willing to be conscripted? How do you get them willing to pay taxes for wars? Uh, well, you give them rights. Um, and while that sounds perhaps over cynical, it, it isn't really. Uh, and the political theorist Max Weber, who did a lot of work on constitutions himself, uh, made this explicit. He said that, you know, 
as wars were getting bigger, uh, so was male democracy because states needed manpower and giving people uh, a modicum of rights was one way that perhaps you could entice people into the armed services. And this becomes something that uh, territories across the globe are becoming aware of increasingly in the second half of the 19th century. And of course, in your book, you mentioned that the other half of humanity, women, are conspicuously left out of most of these or, or nearly all of these constitutional uh, projects. And, you know, it's, it's, it's quite dramatic when you think about the example of France, right? I mean, the birthplace of revolutionary political thought, yet a country which enfranchised women only in 1944. How were lives of individuals uh, limited and restricted, I mean, if those individuals were women, uh, by these new constitutions? And, and what explains almost a, a global retrogression in the rights of women in this era? I mean, you see this even in a place like Hawaii, as, as you mentioned in your book. Yes. Well, it, it's partly, again, this issue of war, defense, giving people favors in return for a willingness to be conscripted and so forth. Part of, of, of that involved a, an increasingly explicit privileging of male citizens. Uh, this was one of the perks. Uh, you accepted responsibility to defend the state if need be, uh, and what was the sign of that, that you got the vote, but you got the vote because you were a man and therefore it was thought uniquely competent to defend the state. Women, women did not. Um, and now you could argue, well, what's what's new about that kind of binary view? Because after all, uh, for most of human history, uh laws, customs have worked or tended to work against females, particularly poorer females. So you might argue, well, what's new about a constitution doing that too? Well, what I think made this more insidious was, of course, that a political constitution that's written down is a law. It becomes cemented not just into people's attitudes, but into the statute book. So as women became more activist in the 19th century, wanting political rights, they found it a much harder game because they, they weren't just having to fight against custom they were having to fight against a written law. There it was, down on paper, in the statute book. And therefore, for women to get these rights, they therefore had to change the law, which is much harder than, than just wrestling with custom, arguably. I, I should say there are some exceptional areas which are are breaking this pattern rather. Um, my favorite counter example is Pitcairn, a tiny island in the South Pacific, which gives women as well as men the right to vote in 1837, an extraordinarily early stage. Uh, and, and that sticks. Um, and in fact, the Pacific region is quite good in some areas as regards women. Both New Zealand and Australia give women voting rights uh, well before the First World War. So I'm not saying this is a standard pattern across the globe, but certainly the, the initial trend with written constitutions is not to liberate women. Yes, I mean, that's, that's one thing which I found particularly interesting about your book, about how the, the South Pacific in, in, in general uh, seems to hold all these interesting examples of, of, of rights being granted in ways that were, or that were not granted in other parts of, of the world. Um, I've always wondered about this contradiction in general. I mean, you, you see uh, in like Jacobin France, right? I mean, you, you see women being cut out of, of, of political uh, discourse. And then I think in the Reform Act of 1832 in Great Britain, women were prohibited, explicitly 
prohibited uh, from from you know the, the franchise. What what explains this? I mean, I, I mean, it, it it maybe it's 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 just me speaking or thinking from the perspective of 2022 of seeing some sort of contradiction between expansive rights for men and the demand for universal male suffrage, yet at the same time, kind of a, a hardening of the boundaries amongst uh, amongst women. Is it just military uh, considerations here, or are there other undercurrents at play that explain this this apparent contradiction, at least from our perspective today? I think there's there's many factors, and and there are local variations. For example, uh, you mentioned the 1832 Reform Act in the UK. Uh, well, that did indeed say explicitly for the first time that uh, the franchise was uh, a male preserve, but um, that didn't operate in Scotland, um, and. Goodness knows why. I mean, I, I think it was probably a, something of an accident. You, you could think of all sorts of reasons, and the reasons sometimes vary in different parts of the globe. As I say, this, this idea that armed conscription is becoming increasingly necessary, therefore you privilege men with the vote as some kind of quid pro quo for uh, hauling them in to fight if need be, and you don't need to do this or want to do this with women. But there's also other ideas. Um, the UK, up to this point, doesn't have a written constitution. But if you look at the arguments against women's suffrage in Britain advanced in the 19th century and the early 20th century, in the early 20th century by people like Winston Churchill, for example, um, he's, he's invoking the empire. He's saying, well, you know, we are a great imperial power. Uh, we really need to be about masculinity. Now, of course, the fact that Queen Victoria had been a female monarch at a time of vast imperial growth um, makes that a rather strange argument. But, but seeing how the exclusion of females from the franchise is being legitimated in different parts of the world at precisely the same time as more and more men get the vote is very, very interesting. Um, and, you know, working out how different areas uh, rationalize this difference is, is intriguing. Um, and I certainly found it so when I wrote the book. I think another great opponent of, of female suffrage in Great Britain was, of course, uh, Lord Curzon, right, the, the former viceroy of, of India, who deployed similar arguments about masculinity and, and imperial solidarity and such when trying to argue that women should not get the vote. Yes. So as we come to the end of this recording, I, I wanted to ask you a, a few questions about your scholarship. And, but first, I want to ask you about your, your, your writing and uh, writing in general in, in the historical pro uh, profession. Uh, one thing I particularly admire about your, your work is that you, you write in a, in a very clear and engaging manner. Um, but at the same time, we're in a profession, the, the historical profession, uh, where many of us do precisely the opposite, right? I mean, we, we write in an opaque and jargon-riddled jargon manner. Why can historians be such poor writers? Well, some people just are poor writers, um, and, and that's, that's what they are. Um, I think there's often a kind of bizarre snobbery and um, superciliousness involved uh, in, uh, certainly as far as some, by no means the majority of academics perhaps, but that there is this sense that you can encounter that if something is attractive to read, it must be because it's not rigorous. Um, and so you get some of these put downs being used. Oh, well, so-and-so writes very elegantly or even worse, well, the book is fun. 
Um, these these are these are put downs, and I think it's a shame because, of course, um, uh, you you have to, prose is not enough. Um, you you do have to be rigorous. You do have to research. You do have to uh, unpack complicated arguments. But on the other hand, if history is to have the importance in the world, which it seems to me it desperately needs to have, not least at present, then it's got to be read. Uh, and I, I do feel that sometimes, perhaps because people are used to writing very specialized articles for arcane journals, that when they come to write books, they're still writing in the same fashion. Whereas a book has potentially a much wider readership and, and therefore a book should be written, it seems to me, accordingly. I want people uh, to read my books, if they will, uh, and to get ideas from them, because that's that's why I do what I do. I think even for writing articles, there's a, a strong case to be made about how you know writing in a clear and engaging manner still does not get in the way of, of conveying important specialist scholarship concepts. I think in many ways it's 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 part of the training. Uh, that's one of the problems I think we're facing in the historical profession right now. And I, I just recall back to my own time in grad school. I, you know, I was I was at, at Harvard, and I remember in the first year of uh, my grad school training, and I you know I came to grad school from a professional background. I I didn't come straight out of undergrad, and I didn't do a master's in history. I'd worked in the real world and came into history, and I was taken aback because. The year I, uh, the first year I was there, Carolyn Elkins uh, was uh, the recipient of the, the, the Pulitzer Prize for a book on the Mau Mau Rebellion. And there was actually discussion among some of the members of my cohort that this could be a bad thing for her tenure of prospects, that she had a book that, uh, you know, had, you know, popular, uh, you know, receptivity and, you know, was actually doing stuff in the real world. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very deep problem, I think, that we face. Yes, uh, and one's just got to keep pushing. I mean, you know, I, I partly take the view, let a thousand flowers bloom. You know, if someone wants to write in a very esoteric way, uh, feels that's their job, um, doesn't really care about readership, well, fine, you know, that's that's their choice. But we can't all follow in that direction. And I, I take your point. I, I think that this needs to start earlier, that um, graduates need to be taught, undergraduates need to be taught indeed how to express themselves, how to be clear. Um, and how how indeed to persuade, because uh, that's that's what one is doing. After all, we we are making a case. We want people to understand our line of argument, and hopefully um, to get ideas from it, to agree with some of the points we're making. So expression, how we how we put ourselves in words, on the page, on the screen, it, it's very important. Could you tell us a little bit about your, your current projects, what you're working on at the moment? Um, yes, I, I'm in a kind of interim phase, as I always tend to be after a, a big book, uh, The Gun, The Ship and The Pen, uh, the book that we've been talking about, uh, took me over 10 years to think about, mull over, and then uh, work out and, and, and write. So it left me feeling uh, sort of exhausted at various levels. And I didn't feel that I wanted immediately to try and embark on another big synthetic volume. So what I decided to do was to explore a kind of biography again, because writing biographies, historical biographies, interest me, but, but trying to do so in different ways. And I became 
interested in looking again at Edward Gibbon uh, and his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, uh, this extraordinary multi-volume book uh, saga he produces in the 1770s and 1780s. And Gibbon has largely been written about, obviously, by ancient historians, by literary historians, by intellectual historians. But I wanted to write about him in more global terms, because this is somebody, the book uh, that Gibbon produces is one of the most translated history books in the world. Uh, for example, both uh, Nehru and Gandhi read Gibbon's decline and fall when they are locked up by the British in prison for their pro-independence activities. And Gandhi in particular clearly gets a lot out of Gibbon. And the way that Gibbon, again, spreads across the world and the way, of course, he's, he's writing about the fall of a massive empire in the 1770s and 1780s when Britain's own empire is uh, being torn apart with the American Revolution. Uh, and when other empires like the Mughal Empire, uh, the Polish Empire, uh, are all coming under pressure, uh, I thought that that I could bring my interests to uh, to build a rather different understanding of this rather strange uh, and tormented individual, Edward Gibbon. So that's what I'm trying to do. As I, I think I brought up earlier in a, in a separate conversation, Gibbon is, again, all over the place <laughs> when you research aspects of Indian history. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've seen references here and there to uh, his work in, in some nationalist uh, conversation in the 1870s. And of course, as you mentioned, um, you know, he's he's on the reading table, so to speak, of people like Nehru and, and Gandhi later on. Um, it, you know, many of these canonical books from the 1700s and 1800s still have a certain power uh, in modern India. And you still find them in, in the old libraries um, around places like Bombay, where I'm speaking to you from. If I can yeah. ask you... Uh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Um, no, I was, I was going to say, I, I'm also intrigued by the way, and it isn't just in India. Um, it, 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 again, you can trace this in other continents, how Gibbon is read both by those who are admiring of empire. Um, Cecil Rhodes uh, in South Africa was a great fan of Edward Gibbon. But then he, Gibbon is also read by opponents of empire uh, and by people way out uh, on the left. Um, so, for example, uh, yes, you've got Cecil Rhodes in South Africa really taking up Gibbon, but you've also got uh, South African socialists and early Marxists taking up Gibbon. Uh, and using different parts of his text for their own ideological pursuits. So I, I like the way that this ancient book, uh, comparatively ancient, late 18th century, is constantly being reread and reused, not just in different parts of the globe, but for different political purposes. I imagine it, it probably even has some currency today in, in America, right? I, I think in, in right-wing circles, you have this constant worry of the overthrow of democracy, ironically, perhaps now. But um, I remember, for example, I grew up in California and um, in the letters to the editor column in our newspaper, there'd be references to you know, the end of Roman democracy or the end of the Roman empire. And Gibbon would come up once or twice in letters to the editor also quite commonly. Yes, and uh, those wanting to draw analogies 
Um, and, and Richard Nixon did this during his uh, rather unfortunate presidency between the decline of the Roman Empire and its fall and what Nixon feared would be a decline and fall of the American Empire. So, yes, the, 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 the American resonance of the book has been always a considerable one. The last question I want to ask you is what you're currently reading. Uh, might you have any recommendations? Oh, that that is um, very difficult. Partly because I found it <laughs> I found it hard um, really to have much time for reading with with all the other things I've been doing. Um, but I have read uh, a rather intriguing uh, history book recently, which has the inelegant uh, title useful bullshit and it's about <laughs> <laughs> it's about uh the chinese constitution which which we need all of us to know a lot more about um and you know the theme of the book is uh i suppose what the title is trying to get over that people too easily assume because china is an increasingly authoritarian one-party state, that its constitution doesn't matter. Um, and the author is trying to show why, uh, why the constitution, um, why do Chinese politicians find it useful, um, and, and, and what does this document, uh, which is too easily dismissed, have to tell us? Um, and, and since I wasn't able uh, to go deeply into the 20th century and I wasn't able to uh, focus in any detail on China, I, I, I read this book with some interest, uh, despite its, as I say, somewhat unfortunate title. Oh, interesting title. And, uh, you know, if any book that deals with the Chinese constitution, as, as you mentioned, uh, will no doubt have great relevance, especially uh, as we see what develops in Taiwan after what has been happening with uh, Russia and Ukraine. So thank you very much, Linda, for joining us today. I, I really appreciate speaking with you um, on your book, uh, and I look forward to seeing what you produce after this. So do I. Thank you so much. Take thank care. You. Okay. You were listening to Past Imperfect a special podcast series by SPGIMR, brought to you by SPGIMR's Center for Wisdom and Leadership, produced by Vinita Dvivedi.